so the, the, the title of this session has to do with soil carbon management. And um, I hope to give you a little background on how I got interested in it and what my research was about. So th this objective is, uh, is what I want to try to get across. So I have outlined 10 sections of the presentation and we will sort of follow that outline. Um, and what I would like to do is go through each section and stop at the end of that section for questions. And if, if we have no questions, we will go on to the next. And if we have questions, we'll try to address them there on that specific section. So I'm not sure where Coffee Break will come in on that, but we will try to, uh, to continue with that. So, there's a lot of verbiage there, and, and I just do this for my own outline and getting organized. So you in agriculture have to understand the importance of soil because we get 95% of our food that comes from the soil. If 95% if if of our food comes from that, then we must try to understand to protect and preserve the soil. And one of the things that I promote is, is this carbon management that allows us to maintain the, um, uh, the soil quality and the pr productive capacity of those soils. So uh, I use this statement about our soils are the fundamental foundation of our life and our economy and we use our resources of the soil, the water, the air, and the sun to maintain our food production. And we, and particularly the farmers, have to be the stewards of that land to protect it for future generations. In the U.S., we estimate that about one farmer feeds 100 people, and those people will have uh, some decision power in, in, in a democratic society, and so it behooves the farmers to try to do the best they can in terms of providing stewardship. We had a former president says that the, the nation that destroys its soil destroys itself, Franklin Roosevelt. And as a soil scientist, I have biases, but I don't apologize for those biases because I want to help you understand the importance of the soils for us. So when we look at this, uh, the soil and the living system, I'm, I'm honored to be invited here to talk about the living system. and. Uh, as I indicated already, that they're responsible for about 95% of our food, but our soil resources enable this process of photosynthesis and respiration for energy capture and utilization through this carbon. Uh, the soil contains this living biological partners that are important to us, enabling carbon and nutrient cycling. And from my perspective, we must protect and treat our soils with respect to maintain food security. And I will try to uh, encourage you to understand the importance of carbon in that, in that uh, challenge. Uh, one of my colleagues, Ratan Lau, states that the health of the soil, the plants, the animals, the people, and the ecosystems are all interdependent, interconnected, and indivisible. You're a part of that ecosystem, and we all have to start working together. So we look at that soil as being responsible for good global health, ecosystem health, on that list of, of human health, animal health, soil health, and, and, and the atmosphere. Because we know that, well, I'll show you in some of my work, that when you till the soil, plow it, there's a large burp of carbon dioxide that goes out into the atmosphere to the point where we have lost between 30 and 60% of the carbon in the soils in the Midwest. I'm not sure what you've lost here in France, but you have been farming a little bit longer. So soil health is very important to us and understanding that we're working with a living biological system. So if you only take one thing home from this session is that carbon and the carbon cycle is key. So this living soil that healthy soil is key, and the way we maintain this soil health is through carbon management. 
And so we need food security, and that's dependent on carbon and nutrient cycling. We need to mit mitigate some of the aspects of climate. We need to improve the environmental quality. We need to improve the water use efficiency. And there's many other social issues that uh, are, are important to us. And so you understand that the soil is the fundamental foundation of all these things that are important to us and providing us with three meals a day. So uh, the, the, the physical, the chemical, and the biological properties and processes are very important to support this life. And so if we look at the soil as a, as a, as a living system, uh, we, we need to worry, work, work on preserving the genetic diversity. Uh, and so understanding that it is a living system, you just don't go out there and beat on it and drive over the heavy tractor and compact it um, because that damages the, the biology and we're finding out that, that that's very important for us. So for all those reasons that are listed, um, the, the, a living soil repository is an investment in our future and that enhances the scientific community's ability to advance soil health research and agricultural sustainability. You want to leave your farm for, your next, for the next generation in better shape than you <coughs> found it. And this challenge uh, is, a, is a tremendous responsibility for anyone in agriculture. This living soil is a, is a biological system and it contains, in English I call them critters, that, that include mammals, earthworms, insects, slugs, microfauna, microflora, actinomycetes, bacteria, and algae. And if you add up the effect of those requiring carbon nutrition, it's the equivalent of five African elephants per hectare feeding on the energy that goes in there through the carbon system. So those five African elephants if you understand that they will be taking about 150 kilos of hay a day, you understand how much carbon has come into that system to maintain a healthy and, and physical uh, population doing all the environmental things. So anyway, if, if you understand how much hay those five elephants would need a day, that's exactly what we got to put in. And, and this is one of the reasons why, even though we're doing cover crops and, and growing two crops in a, in, a, in a year, we cannot get enough carbon into the system to bring it back up to optimum. And every tillage event gives a real steep decline in the carbon because of the way it disrupts the soil and disrupts the, the, the living critters that are there. So, uh, that's not my analogy, it's one of my colleagues, Jerry Hatfield from <laughs> Iowa State. But you have to understand that the soils are pretty complex and it's just not a glob of, of, of soil. Uh, there's interactions in terms of the formation of these aggregates and carbon is very important in that. The roots and the um, development of mycorrhizal fungi is also a part of it. And so it's it's not simple. But if we understand that, that managing the carbon, it's sort of like a blanket that covers a lot of the harms that we might put in to the way we've been doing agricultural soils and, and the manipulation. So the, the soil does a lot of things for us and I've identified five essential functions. Uh, it can regulate the water. It sustains plant and animal life in our life. It can also filter and, and buffer potential pollutants, taking out some of the pesticides that are that have been put on it. It's very important in cycling nutrients, particularly the ones that are important in crop production. And it provides physical stability and support so you can go across it with equipment. So there's uh, more than just growing the plants and that. There's these other things that we call them ecosystem services that are important to us. Okay, the, the question is whether 
uh, carbon fixes the pollutants. And, uh, and, 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 that's, and that's a good question. The carbon is there for the energy source for the microbes that are in the soil. And when you have a lot of carbon, you have a lot of microbial population, a lot of, a lot of bugs, and you have this diversity. And some one of those microbes is capable of degrading some of those pesticides. It's, it's not the carbon. So, so sometimes it's locked up on the organic matter, but eventually the microbes will decompose and, and, and decrease the effectiveness of that material. Excellent question. So um, we have to understand where this carbon cycle uh, process and the carbon accumulation starts. And if we did not have solar energy, uh, which is the, the driver for all living systems here on Earth. And through this process of photosynthesis, we take and transform that solar energy into biochemical energy in the form of the carbon, which in our system, it's a universal carrier of energy and nutrition for all living biological systems, particularly what's in the soil. So I have my biases, but if you understand that statement, of the importance of carbon, some of the rest of this presentation will be much easier to, uh, to accept. Uh, and so we, and, and, and you as farm managers, your challenge is to maximize the capture of that energy. That energy is free to us, and it's the only one that allows us to survive on Earth. And so we must find ways to be more efficient and treat the, the leaves of the plant as solar panels collecting this energy that you're in the process of converting to biochemical energy that is, supports all animal life. And so it starts with the process of photosynthesis. And so this solar power uh, powers the, uh, the, the carbon cycle and the uh, the power of diversity in our national, natural systems is, is pretty important. So uh, the plants are the main source of our food and energy generation, starting at the, at the top of that cycle with the sun and a little bit of chlorophyll in the leaves. So, and then what this conference is emphasizing, that small layer of soil on the earth is sort of a living skin. And it's very delicate in terms of what happens with the soil biology, and we need to manage that more effectively. And hopefully we'll get better representation of what we can do for, um, from an agriculture perspective. I already indicated that sunlight is the only energy for life on Earth, and you as ag producers must manage those plants to capture the solar energy and transform it into biochemical energy in the form of carbon. So your challenge is to maximize the use of those sunshine hours, to maximize the capture of this free energy. And um, there are some limitations. And in, in my part of the world, in Minnesota, we have three months where you experience minus 20, minus 30 degrees Celsius a few days, and nothing will survive that. But we still have to find some way to protect the soil and try to utilize what ener whatever small amount of energy might be coming in during that off-season period. And so this is a little bit of a chemistry lesson. Uh, it's the process of photosynthesis, where we take carbon dioxide with the symbol CO2, combine it with water in the presence of sunlight and a little bit of chlorophyll to produce a six-carbon element on there that's a, a sugar plus oxygen. And so going from left to right across there is, is an energy capture and it, the energy is stored in, in that sugar molecule. If you reverse that process, we call it respiration, and we oxidize or we break down that sugar and that releases useful energy for us to do work and carry out our, our functions. And this this equation is the, is the uh, basis of, of all life on Earth, and it is the way we generate the fuel for, for all biological life. 
So the, the soil is a living and it's a life-giving natural resource that's important to us. But it's just primarily supporting the plants and recycling some of the nutrients and storing some of the carbon so that the next generation of plants can utilize some of that in, the, uh, in our agricultural systems. Anyway, you, it's, it's a, a simple cycle, and the carbon dioxide plus water goes to make that sugar and some oxygen, and that's the energy capture part of that cycle. The reverse of that is respiration, taking that sugar and combining with oxygen to release energy, and I want you to understand that this is a relatively simple cycle that it's, it's, uh, as it's represented, but I want to assure you that the devil's in the detail. It's a very, very complex process, and we have to understand that. And you don't have to understand all the details, but if you get some of the general concepts, then it uh, uh, helps you understand why carbon is so important in an agriculture production system. So our plants, the plants that you manage, are the main source of our food and energy generation. So... We have a farmer in South Dakota that made this statement. And if you were students in my regular class, you would memorize this quote forward and backward and upside down. The quote is, carbon is the framework and the fuel for every living thing. And that's important enough, I will repeat it. Carbon is the framework and the fuel of every living thing. And if you understand that, then it should be starting to penetrate the importance of carbon. I use the capital C, which is the, the chemical symbol for carbon, to show how some of that fits together. And so conservation starts with a capital C. It starts with carbon. Uh, conservation creates carbon connections. And carbon is uh, creating these pathways to our food sustainability. So, um, I, I, at, the, at the risk of being too, too much repetition, uh, but in a, in a teaching system, sometimes that's the only way that it will sink in. And uh, so, when a farmer talks like that, he already understands the importance of carbon. And he, this fellow has been no-tilling for about 20 years, and. Uh, uh, doing a very good job in including cover crops into the system. So, uh, you're getting to see my biases. Well, I talked briefly a little bit about the carbon cycle, but it's not just the cycling of carbon, it's the carbon energy flow through that system. So in the upper part of this, we talked about the uh, photosynthesis, but now that sugar's coming down, it's coming through the plant stems, going to the roots, some root exudates will be coming out of there, and that's feeding the microbes and soil fauna. Then we have this nutrient cycling and carbon cycling that provide the ecosystem services for us. And the one that's most important to me is the, the food nutrition, because I need three meals a day. So we get that food, feed, fiber, and fuel. And when we digest that food, we oxidize those carbohydrates, some of that carbon dioxide goes back into that carbon cycle. And that's where we get our useful energy by uh, consuming in those, uh, those forms of that energy that's captured in the process of photosynthesis. So it's, it's just not cycling carbon, it's flowing carbon through the whole system, and there's a certain connectivity of the carbon that helps hold that system together. And so it will start out at the, at the leaves, at the top of the plant, down through the soil, and then back around to come back, completing the carbon cycle. But with, within that, there's so many processes, and it's a very complex system that you just have to understand to, um, to get a sense of, of what's going on. So one of the things that we try to do is, is, is get some diversity in the system. And we're trying to get cover crop cocktails in the system so that we can optimize or increase the, the maximum soil organic matter. And so uh, what we're finding out in the last eight or 10 years that the best way to get carbon into the system 
is to utilize the cover crops and do less intensive tillage. And we'll, we'll talk more about that a little bit later. So we have this long list of benefits. And again, uh, I'm happy to share it with you. You don't have to write them down. But the ones in light blue are all directly related to carbon. And so it goes from increasing infiltration by having crop residue on the surface. It reduces soil erosion. And on through that, that deep uh, list, a long list of different factors. But the bottom line in conservation agriculture systems is this synergistic simplicity with minimum soil disturbance that minimizes the carbon and the soil loss. And then the use of these diverse rotations and cover crop mixes, which maximizes soil cover and maximizes carbon input into the system for this soil diversity protection and the regeneration benefits that are, that are in cal uh, conservation agriculture systems. And you don't have to memorize this, but I hope you will take the concepts of this to heart because it's two of the main principles in conservation agriculture systems that we need to apply more on, on the landscape. Uh, and we will talk a little bit more about conservation agriculture systems. Okay, the, the question comes down to, is it more efficient for carbon input and production in organic farming systems compared to uh, well, conventional farming systems? Uh, No-till conventional. No-till conventional. Okay, uh, excellent question. Um, in the organic systems, uh, where the primary form of weed control is, is tillage or cultivation, the, the, the organic people put more manure on and manage the carbon better than the, some of the other people in, in conventional agriculture. But for weed control, they, every time you till the soil, there's a, a, a loss of, of carbon from that. And so uh, it's, and not having any other chemicals to, uh, to be concerned about, it's, it's beneficial to have that in, in an organic system. But with, with the no-till system, and just a no-till by itself, there is not enough carbon that's put into that system to make much difference. It's, there's a big debate in the scientific community about how much carbon you can store with no-till. In some soils you get a little bit, some soils you don't get anything. And so what is happening now in, in the soil health movement in the U.S. is the um, combination of minimum soil disturbance with, with no-till and the maximum carbon input that I just showed you in that, that previous slide. Oh. And so um, I, I can't give you an action that, that organic is better than conventional. The, the devil is in some of those details that um, we would have to talk about. But that, that's a general, my, my perception of the difference between the two systems. And uh, if there was some way that we could control weeds in the organic system, it would have a lot more merit than, uh, 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 than using cultivation as, as a part of that. I, I understand the question is, is there some way with more efficient use of the carbon to nitrogen ratio in the material to get more carbon in the system? And, and that's an excellent question. With soybean, and I think everybody understands soybean, it has a very narrow carbon to nitrogen ratio of about 20 carbons to one nitrogen. And so when the leaf hits the soil, it decomposes very, very fast. Within two or three weeks, it's, poof, it's gone. If you take wheat with a carbon to nitrogen ratio, maybe 80 carbon to one nitrogen, that takes much longer to decompose. It also ties up any nitrogen that's available for that next crop. And what farmers sometimes do is just apply a little more nitrogen fertilizer to speed up that decomposition process. And, and we have a whole range of species that go from 20 to 1 to 100 to 1, and your wood chips are about 300 to 1, 300 carbon to 1 nitrogen. And that, 
they put that in tile drain systems to capture the nitrogen so it doesn't go down the, the river. So um, we, we have many options, and, and the plant can help us control that as long as we understand the principle of diversity and putting that to work so that we can um, optimize it for, for your particular management uh, issue. So um, uh, there, there's times when you want it to decompose fast, and there's times when you want it there. In our case in, in Minnesota and the U.S., we want some residue protection to go through the winter months because there's nothing can grow when it's so cold. And so we would like to have something with a larger carbon to nitrogen ratio. Well, it, 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 it's, a, it's a continuous process, and the rate of that cycling is controlled by the availability of carbon or, or the lack of carbon. And so when you have a lot of carbon that comes in and it cycles relatively fast because the microbes digest it and decompose it very quickly. That also simultaneously releases some of those nutrients that are in the biomass that uh, uh, are important to the next generation of plants. And so it's important that, uh, that we try to optimize those conditions so that we accomplish the, the nutrient release and the availability of that. And, and the timing is, is a, can be controlled somewhat by the carbon to nitrogen ratio. <laughs> the question is, uh, I, sh I sh shouldn't be smiling. It it's a good question. The question is for the translators is that, uh, is it possible that we can have some enzymes or some mechanism in the soil that can capture the carbon for us? And um, I think that would be an excellent idea if, if you could find the, the right system. But right now, Mother Nature's been working for three million years with this process of photosynthesis, and it's still working for us in terms of capturing that carbon. I, I know of no direct way of something in the soil capturing carbon un unless there was um, a chemical reaction that would attract it and cause it to precipitate out. Um, I, I, it, that's a very complex question, and I'm not sure that, uh, uh, well, I, I'm a soil scientist, but I, I don't have the knowledge about any enzymes that, that could accomplish that process uh, without having the solar energy that comes into the system. So I, I wish I could answer the question a little better, but um, uh, I'm, I'm not aware of any. And you're relatively long, young, you can start doing some creative thinking and... <laughs> okay, uh, okay, thank you, thank for that question and I shouldn't be smiling. The, the question boils down to the carbon-nitrogen ratio controlling the rate of decomposition and the question I think wants to control that decomposition without putting any extra nitrogen in to do that. Um, what I understand is happening, the natural equilibrium of the carbon to nitrogen ratio in the soil is between about 10 to 1 and 12 to 1. That's the equilibrium value that comes down to after many years in the soil. And so when you put soybeans in the system with a value of 20 to 1, it's got enough nitrogen to come down to that 10, 11 to 1 ratio very, very quickly. But if you put in a maize or if you put in wheat stubble that has a carbon to nitrate rate 80 to 1, it's going to take some time. And if you have the luxury of the time letting Mother Nature take care of it, it will eventually get there. But if you want to speed that process up, traditionally we have to add a little bit of nitrogen to speed up the decomposition to get the overall the carbon to nitrogen ratio come to that equilibrium value of, of, of 11 or 12 to 1. And um, I'm not aware of anything that you can do or add to the soil to make that happen faster than just adding some nitrogen. Okay, so, so the, the question then is, is uh, how do you <laughs> speed up the decomposition without adding nitrogen? So there's no, no negative effect on the following crop. 
Well, part of the, part of the challenge is that the, the, the microbes are there working and they have to decompose a certain amount of that biomass to release enough nitrogen. So when you look at the plant biomass, it's, it's anywhere 45 to 46 percent carbon. And the plant biomass in, in maize, maybe 1, 1.3 percent nitrogen. And so you have to decompose a lot of maize to get enough nitrogen to make a difference. But if the, if the whole process is controlled by the carbon to nitrogen ratio and the availability of that nitrogen, um, the, the, the microbes are going to do it in, in a natural way and it's going to be controlled to the point where if you as a manager want to increase the rate of decomposition of that wheat straw, you're going to have to put on a little more nitrogen to help get that nitrogen, carbon to nitrogen ratio smaller faster. The, there's a time delay with the microbes decomposing to get enough nitrogen and if you don't get that nitrogen there, then there's going to be negative effects on the following crop. Well, the, the other alternative in that is, is in terms of using cover crops where you would have a diverse mix of cover crops that would have some legumes that have the narrow CN ratio and then that when nitrogen become readily available. And so that's where the diversity uh, comes in in terms of trying to manage the system. Uh, it's, it's not a very simple yes or no black or white answer. It's a very complex system. And what we're finding is that we get much better control of the decomposition when we have uh, 10 to 15 different species in a cover crop mix that covered the range from a high carbon to nitrogen ratio to a low carbon to nitrogen ratio. And when we do that, then there's enough nitrogen for the next crop that doesn't really limit it. Well, <coughs> the, the, the question is, uh, with more carbon in the soil, will there be more nitrogen become available to the plant? Okay, and, and, and the rate of that becoming available is, is the critical thing. And so when you have a biomass of, of like wheat straw that has uh, 80 to 1 carbon to nitrogen ratio, it, it's just longer to release that nitrogen as opposed to a legume that has a very narrow uh, carbon to nitrogen ratio. And, but that biomass has to be decomposed and the molecules break apart to provide the, nat uh, the nitrogen for the uh, mi microbes to bring together that and uh, that ratio controls a lot of that activity. And so the rate of decomposition is going to be a lot slower with a wide carbon to nitrogen ratio than with a very narrow carbon to nitrogen ratio. And it depends on the, the material that you put in. And so the, one of the solutions that I see for that is the diversity in the cover crops. You, with your agronomic crop, you, uh, you're sort of locked in because that's the one that you make your most income off of. And if you want to try to speed up that decomposition, then we must find some way to either put the nitrogen on to bring that level up or to get cover crops into that system that have a smaller carbon to nitrogen ratio to speed up that process more naturally than, than pouring it out of a bag. Okay? Okay, we go to a new section, and uh, I don't know what I'm going to say about carbon petitioning. Um, oh, okay. When we look at the, uh, the, the, the plant, and I work with maize a lot, we capture that carbon dioxide in that process of photosynthesis so we can get up to uh, 16 tons of, of biomass and that's about 46, 45 percent carbon. And so when we have the grain that's about 5.5 tons, that's exported from the field. So we lose about one third of the carbon when we take the grain off the field. The, the biomass, the remaining above ground biomass is another about five tons and there's estimates that the 
material, the root biomass, and the exudates that go into the soil uh, are about 5.5 tons. So we have to understand that there's the carbon's fixed all above ground in terms of photosynthesis, but some of it goes to the grain that's exported from the field, some goes into the biomass, and then some goes into the root systems. And we're trying to optimize that goes into the root system, so all of these processes in terms of the CN ratio net are, are optimized for us. Um, the, so I, I used to just roughly use a, a third of the carbon fixed comes in and is exported into grain. Another third of the carbon is in the plant biomass above ground, and another third of the carbon is in the root biomass and the root exudates. And in a natural system, that should all be in balance. <clears throat> so we have to find some way to replace that carbon that's exported in the grain that we eat or you feed to animals to maintain a close to a natural system. And so this is part of the reason why we're, we're not getting much increases in carbon, um, because we, we're not keeping things in balance. And I hope I have a, a slide here later on to, uh, to uh, demonstrate what happens when we do that uh, with, with intensive tillage. So um, this is just an, another way of looking at it. And um, uh, we just have to have a better understanding of how it's partitioned between above ground, below ground, and um, everything that's important to us. So when we take a look at the nutrients that are removed in the grain, uh, we've got to find some way of trying to get them back into that system. And so when we look at that uh, in, in the conventional agriculture system, the, the, the amount of carbon and nitrogen and P205 and the K2O that's moved in that grain is substantial. And then if we're concerned about using the, the above ground biomass as a form of bioenergy, and we remove that from the field, it becomes a, a, a double negative because we're taking a lot of the nutrients and exporting it from the field. So uh, I thought I heard someone say yesterday that the farmers in France don't want to have agriculture be responsible for renewable energy or renewable biomass energy. And I hope it's because they want that carbon to go into the soil to maintain the health and the vigor of the, the biological system rather than helping in terms of climate mitigation. We in agriculture got to do what we need to do with respect to climate mitigation, but my personal biases are that we need to feed ourselves first so we can think of creative ways to address the climate change issues that may be helped by uh, bioenergy production from, from an agricultural standpoint. Uh, it's, it's a, personal view, and I'm not sure where you stand on it, but um, um, as far as I'm concerned, we've got to try to maximize the carbon input to that soil system because the soil is the foundation for everything that, that goes on in our earth. So some of the things we can do to increase the soil organic matter is by increasing the production of plant material, in one case by irrigation or fertilization to increase the biomass, or we can use cover crops to improve the, the vegetative stands and uh, inter introduce plants into the system that, that produce more biomass. Uh, we can also increase the supply of organic materials by protecting from fire and, uh, and then using forage by grazing rather than, than by harvesting the, uh, the biomass and we can do things in terms of controlling insects and rodents. And, uh, and there's some opportunity to do that, but when we graze it, there's some natural synergistic benefits that show up that uh, when the cow passes manure on the field, some of those nitrogen and carbon is recycled and not removed from the system. Uh, there's, what's removed is the, the meat and the material that the animal that um, uh, walks off of the field and, uh, and 
but it returns a major portion of the, of the carbon and the nutrients through the manure to that system. We can decrease the decomposition by uh, reducing or eliminating tillage, and, uh, or we can keep it saturated with water in, in terms of not providing any aerobic conditions to oxidize the carbon. And we can also keep the soil cool with, with vegetative cover. So if it's cool, it's not gonna decompose as fast. And uh, these are some of the things that you can do to try to manage the rate of decomposition of soil organic matter. Um, practices that, that decrease soil organic matter uh, is we've, we've done it in terms of replacing the uh, perennial vegetation with short season annual crops and, uh, uh, and utilizing monoculture we, we do not have the diversity in terms of input in, into the system. So. Um, Uh, we also can decrease the supply of organic materials by uh, burning forests and rains and, and crop residue, but all that does is almost instantaneously puts back about 90% of the carbon that was there and releases the carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. And to me, that's a waste of, of uh, carbon because it's, there's no chance for the biology to utilize that and carry on their, their normal activities. We can decrease the organic matter by increasing the, uh, the decomposition by tillage, by drainage, and fertilization. And sometimes when you put on excess nitrogen, it increases the mineralization rate so that the organic matter decomposes faster. And as a result, there's a net decline in organic matter attributed to the large amounts of nitrogen fertilizer that are added. Okay, uh, into the next question, we'll look at, at the role of carbon in physical, chemical, and biological. My carby carbon somehow got inverted, and uh, I'm not sure what happened on that. Anyway, the, the soil health is supposed to be riding on carbon, and the balance between food security and the global population need are uh, in balance by maintaining the soil health that depends on soil carbon. So when you look at the relationships of soil organic matter to soil health, uh, the physical things include things like bulk density, infiltration, soil structure, macropores, and uh, water holding capacity, and on and on with that, that large list of um, factors. They're the physical attributes that, that have to be considered. We also have chemical ones in terms of electrical conductivity, the cation exchange capacity, the nitrate and nutrient concentrations, and phosphorus, and all of these other chemical components that are important to us in maintaining soil fertility. And now the one that's coming into bigger play is the, the biological part that we're starting to understand uh, with more emphasis on the biology, we're getting better results in terms of maintaining some sort of a balance with the carbon, maintaining some protect, um, pr production of the soil surface with crop residues on the surface, and all the time we're nurturing the soil biology with this carbon that's been captured and uh, available in, in the plant biomass. And the, the microbial activity again, is controlled by the carbon to nitrogen ratio that we've been talking about in that biomass that is the primary energy source. So the, uh, the soil productivity depends on all three of these, these physical, chemical, and biological factors that are important to us. So the uh, importance of um, healthy soil biology I hope it starts to become obvious in terms of what the carbon does for providing energy and what the biomass does in terms of providing nutrients that are, are available. Uh, the crop residue things on there can increase the water infiltration and by decreasing the runoff so we get more water storage. Uh, there's a decomposition of the biomass that provides energy for the current 
the population of the microbes. And then that carbon dioxide is, is recycled to the atmosphere. Uh, if we have legumes in the system, we get nitrogen fixation. Uh, we get some suppression of pathogens with that. And we can improve water quality and enhance plant growth. Well, this, this carbon and the carbon cycling is the primary form for uh, forming these stable aggregates that provides the porosity needed for water infiltration. It's the porosity for habitat for the microbes and the fungi. And so the carbon plays an intimate role in meeting the needs for, for the soil biology for that whole list of, of reasons. Th the question is, is there a time more favorable to bringing the carbon into the system from a uh, biological perspective? And uh, there, there is times when it's better to bring it in when the soil temperature is cool because there's a lower rate of decomposition of microbial activity decreases when the soil gets cool. Uh, one of the examples I use, if you must till the soil, till it when it's either very, very cold or very, very dry. And so the, the biological system needs some water to carry on all their activities. And so that uh, the, the it, and during the warmer months where you get more rapid decomposition, that's when you have rapid growth. And so the, the plant is synchronized to take the nutrients that are released during the decomposition. And that happens during the summer period when we have optimum temperatures and frequent rainfall events to maintain uh, sufficient activity. Uh, and so it's, it's there, it's a form of energy, and the, if the bugs are going to be there, they're going to utilize that to recycle the carbon and to release the nutrients. So. It's controlled by a lot of biological factors. Temperature and water are the two big ones. And if you want to retain carbon, find some way to keep the soil cold or dry. And if you want the bugs to go and utilize all that carbon, keep it moist, not saturated, but a little bit warmer. And so one of the reasons sometimes for having a mulch on the soil surface it does tend to make the surface layer a few degrees cooler. And it helps protect that and preserves that because of three or four or five degrees Celsius cooler. Good temperature, or good question. Okay, so um, I use this metaphor here to talk about carbon as the backbone of food security. Uh, this carbon is captured in the process of photosynthesis. And as I said before, it's a free energy source. It feeds the soil biology. And the residue protects against soil erosion. Uh, it increases soil structure, infiltration, water holding capacity, water use efficiency, and enhances soil health and human health. And so it provides all these ecosystem services. But what I want you to understand is that this carbon is connected in our ecosystem, just like each of those vertebrae might be an individual carbon atom. And they're connected up and down that to provide a strong backbone. But the same carbon also flows through the system, as I showed you on, a, on an earlier slide. And so we have to try to understand that. And so uh, there's a lot of linkage. There's a lot of connectivity in carbon within our system. And the sooner we understand that, the better we're going to be able to manage that carbon for optimizing production and maintaining food security. So uh, from my perspective, carbon is the capital C that starts conservation. And, and it's in this way that carbon enhances food security. So the, uh, this, the carbon also provides these other ecosystem services. Uh, I've already talked about it, increasing the infiltration, the transpiration, and the biopores. Uh, it increases the, the root exudates as they come down through the plant. And there's a long list of, of, of benefits that carbon can, can increase. But carbon can also be used to decrease evaporation. If you have a mulch layer on the top, that carbon 
acts to decrease evaporation. It decreases runoff and erosion and sedimentation. Um, it decreases some air pollution. And it can provide some resistance to uh, weed germination and, and weed emergence. Uh, carbon can also decrease some compaction and, like I said, decrease the soil temperature, at least near the, near the surface layer. Uh, it decreases the, radio, uh, the solar radiation and the uh, ultraviolet effects on bare soil and the little effect that it has on the, on the soil biology. Um, it can decrease the, uh, the need for tile drainage. And with the mellow soil that you get with the good carbon content, it can decrease any, any energy cost if you have to plant uh, with, with the no-till drill that you, you might save it. So, so from my perspective, carbon is our greatest water management tool that we can utilize. That carbon comes in the form of soil carbon, which enhances the water holding capacity. But it also is available in that plant residue before it's decomposed in the way it acts as a protective cover. OK, one of, one of the things that the farmers are finding out with the cover crops, there's more biomass. And they end up with a mat of, that protects the, the, the soil surface and is more competitive for, for the weed control. And one of our farmers is down to using 10% of the Roundup that he used in the conventional system. And he's hopeful that he will get 100% weed control. We, we must try to get, and by using the diverse cover crops and diverse mixes of them, we get a continuous supply of this thing on the surface, trying to get it to stay 365 days a year. And uh, that's a little bit of a challenge, because traditionally, the no-till people, that's all they did was spray Roundup and, and Paraquat in the same way that the organic people rely on, on tillage. And what tillage does to that residue layer, it just mixes and maximizes the incorporation of it, and it results in a faster decomposition rate. So it's a, it provides a porous barrier over the pot. It's, a, it's not like plastic material, but it's a barrier. And with a, with a dense enough barrier, it becomes uh, limiting. It limits the weeds from, from emerging. You just got to look at it a little differently. It's, it's, it's not the magic of carbon. It's the magic of the plant biomass preventing it, the lights and whatever uh, from, from hitting, hitting the surface. So there's a question in my mind about whether we should sequester carbon or we should be emphasizing cycling of carbon. Now in English, sequester means to lock up, to contain and isolate that carbon from any, any kind of factor that may, may play into it. And so sequester means locking it up. It's no, not available to the microbes. And, uh, but it is taken out of the atmosphere and can contribute to climate mitigation. So uh, the one way I look at that, if we're going to sequester carbon, we're going to store that energy, and it's going to be static energy. It's not going to be available to do any useful work until it's brought back and, and made available to part of the biological system. Whereas in carbon cycling, uh, it's more of an active participation. And we get useful energy out of that through the decomposition of that organic matter. And uh, the, the, the carbon cycling is sort of the, um, in the transition of, of fueling these, these ecosystem services. And so I think we need to do things to help mitigate the climate. But my attitude is that I would rather us focus on cycling the carbon in our agricultural production system to maintain food security. If we have full stomachs, our brain will work much better to find ways to take the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And until we have that security, my personal biases are that we should focus on recycling the carbon. And I'm interested, I, I hope you understand that explanation, and I'm interested in your reaction to that, because the, the, 
Stephen La Falle's effort on capturing this carbon is, and, and sequestering it in principle is right, but in practice, I, I want to make sure that we have enough carbon cycling and energy flowing through that system to guarantee that I get three meals a day. And I hope you want three meals a day also. Um, I, it's a little bit out of left field for, for a carbon guy, but um, um, I give you my, my true attitude toward it. And we can talk more about it in, in, in the break if you're interested in that. So as I was trying to explain about the, the importance of the crop residue, um, it can be there as dead crop residue and still provide a, a passive protective blanket. But if we have a live growing cover crop, it's still capturing carbon, and it can be an active protective blanket and um, utilizing that. And so both of these are uh, sources of food for the, um, the soil biology. Uh, with a dry wheat stubble, the, again, the carbon to nitrogen ratio is going to control the rate of that decomposition. And in this example with the cover crops, uh, uh, with a, uh, a clover, uh, they will have a narrow CN ratio. And so that is going to decompose much more, more quickly. And so this is where the concept of diversity comes in again. You as, as managers on the land, you have to find some way to optimize the combinations of these things to provide the management results that, that you want. And um, uh, in our part of the world, I want to protect that soil during the winter time when there's nothing growing and nothing biologically can, can happen. And so uh, some of my colleagues are working on trying to get um, plants that would be grown in the fall, oilseed crops that would go dormant in the winter time and unless it's a very, very cold winter, they will stay dormant, and then the next spring start to grow again, and that would be maximizing the time as, as long as this, the biological temperatures are within limits, so that we can think about um, various ways of managing the crop residue to, um, to, to get that. So uh, I, I, I apparently don't have my slide in there, but there's... We, we, I would like to see live biomass growing, capturing carbon as, as long as biologically possible. When we don't have that, then w I want to have dead crop residue protecting the soil surface. And th the third option that we're working on is to have something that would grow in the fall, go dormant when the frost is there, but it would still be protecting the soil surface during the winter months from wind erosion and any water erosion that we might have, and then start growing as soon as the conditions are right in the spring. And the fourth option for that is things like compost and uh, the added organic matter or, or manures that can go on uh, and be applied a, an applied form of carbon for that. But as Conrad stated yesterday, composting, while it's good, it speeds up the process and we lose a tremendous amount of carbon before that gets on the land when it's applied as compost. And so, from my perspective, I would rather see that raw material put on the soil rather than composting it and turning it and rolling it to speed up the decomposition because you can lose about 40 to 60 percent of the carbon in that process. What you do doing that is you get some of these micronutrients more readily available. And if that's your goal, then, then it may be okay to uh, uh, go ahead and, and compost the material. But if you want to maximize benefits from carbon, uh, we've got to find some way to uh, not stir that and enhance the rate of decomposition before it's actually applied to the, to the soil surface. Oh, there it is. Okay, so the, um, I use these, my capital C's as carbon in quotes, and we talk about cover crop cocktails. And there's some synergistic benefits that we're seeing when we use these multi-species mixes. And so we're bringing together the individual crop benefits into a community of crops whose synergistic effects uh, the subsequent crops 
and it has uh, greater than the sum of the individual crop contributions in, in terms of impact. And my simple explanation of, of synergy is you have one plus one equals three in terms of benefits. And the diversity in these cover crop cocktails provides that synergistic benefits that are important to us. And so we just can't look at a cover crop uh, and, and hope to get some of these carbon benefits. The diversity and the combination of them in these cocktails uh, is, is important. And so there's one of the ecologists at the University of Minnesota has shown that if you plot the biomass produced as a function of number of species in that mix, that it comes up and starts to plateau at about 15 species in that mix, and it doesn't really change because you've got the maximum capture of solar energy. And if you look at the different functions provided by the cover crops, plotting the same data you know, in terms of biomass as a function of that, it goes up and it starts to plateau at about four different functions. The function that would be like managing infiltration or managing compaction or erosion control or legume nitrogen put into the system. And so if you've got four of these functions combined in this mixture of uh, 15 species, that's the optimum for uh, the combination of these cover crop cocktails. And um, it's, it's, it's not a simple black and white answer. And I'd, I'd be happy to talk more about it um, and uh, see what we can come up with. So from my perspective, the environmental benefits from these cover crop cocktails, they all point to carbon. And uh, this is another quote from a farmer in North Dakota. So in, in recalling the, the physical, chemical, and biological processes, I tried to illustrate here what the carbon does from the biomass and that bio, the diversity within that biomass. And there's just a, a, a lot of individual benefits that come from the carbon in the cover crops and then the cover crops themselves in terms of the root depth, the rate of decomposition, and um, the, the, the total carbon capture that's important to us, and then in terms of the, the nitrogen fixed. It's, it's nice to think of it in little itty-bitty boxes, but when you start to think about it, it's a very complex system, and we can understand it better by only taking apart small portions of it and digging into the details. Uh, and so, and, and, and I say it again, the devil is in the details. So I, I would like you to learn to view uh, the plant as carbon because it is about 45 or 46 percent carbon. And so that gives this plant a lot of power. It has the power to capture more carbon. It stores some carbon in the biomass and in the root system. It also stores energy in that grain that's produced for us. It becomes a food source for us, but then the biomass is a food source for the soil biology. Uh, and the, the carbon input is uh, obvious, and, we, and we've been talking about that. And so there's these environmental benefits that all add up to give us a quality of life. And from my perspective, our quality of life depends on that existence of that plant and the process of photosynthesis. And we have to understand how to manage that carbon so we can optimize all these benefits that that plant can provide for us. So when you understand that those are organisms there, uh, just like you, they get hungry, and we can feed them soil organic matter or, or carbon. And the carbon cycling is, is the key, and the, the, and the microbes are a part of that. I mean, they're the cause of that cycling, and if we didn't have that, you know, the carbon would be building up in the soil, and uh, we wouldn't have any place to, to live. But the decomposition as a result of microbial activity, allows them to carry out their necessary functions and still provide us with a uh, reasonable nutrient base for plant nutrition that are all dependent on this process of photosynthesis. So from my perspective, it's, it's, it's not the storage of the carbon, it's the useful energy that comes out of the cycling of this carbon.
the um, carbon, the water, and the oxygen are some of the, uh, the great connectors of, of our conservation agriculture systems. Um, in the plant economy, the, the currency there is carbon, and it's important because it allows these goods and services to exchange more efficiently with, with the soil economy. The soil biology works in harmony and synchrony, providing these synergistic benefits that I just talked to you about. So this, the soil organic matter generates and regulates these ecosystem services that sustain all life on Earth, as a, as a quote by uh, Ratan Lau. And so it's the interaction of this organic matter and the biology, and one of the big factors in controlling that is the carbon nitrogen ratio of the whole system that sort of regulates the decomposition and, and the rate that things are happening. And in our management efforts to try to enhance the decomposition of the wheat, corn or, or wheat stubble, um, sometimes we may have to add that extra nitrogen to, um, to accomplish that so that it does not impact the, the yield of the, of the next crop. Soil health stands at the center of this integrated and, and holistic approach to managing soil. And I I'm, I'm have my biases about soil carbon processes and properties that, that are integral key components. And um, uh, without that carbon, there's n not going to be very much happen. But if just not the carbon, and, and we wrestle with a little bit the nitrogen carbon to nitrogen ratio, but we have to understand that these two interact, and there's a a hundred other factors that control the rate of decomposition and, and the interaction of the biology and, and their food source. We, we are under pressure. In the, in the U.S., even though we have some no-till, if we have two severe drought years, there will be people going hungry and starving in the U.S. And there's people already starving in various places around the world now. And I, I have a sense of urgency about making sure that we produce the food in a sustainable way, whether you call it regenerative or organic or whatever. And because it takes anywhere from 700 to 1,500 years to make 2.5 centimeters of soil, we cannot afford to lose any. And the pictures we saw yesterday in some of the presentations, you people have more erosion <laughs> That, well, that they show the exaggerated examples. And we have the same thing in the US. So I am pleased to see that you guys are here because I hope I can convince you that there's other ways to look at the system and think just a little bit more about carbon management because there's things that we can do that we've either taken for granted or didn't understand before. And we have to take advantage of our every little increment of knowledge that we get and apply it. And so uh, I, I use this analogy of the cabbage head philosophy, where two heads are better than one, even though one is a cabbage head. Now, do they understand cabbage, the, the, veg, the vegetable that's around? OK. So the, the, the point I want to make is, in the cabbage head philosophy, two heads are better than one, even though one's a cabbage head. So I might be an expert in carbon, and, and you might be the cabbage head. But you might be the expert in politics, and I'm the cabbage head. But when you and I communicate, or any of us communicate back and forth with true interaction, and com we get this synergistic relationship that one plus one equals three in terms of impact. And so I am honored that you are here, but pleased to see that that interaction, I saw on the stage yesterday, those networks were just churning out information and ideas, and it made me feel very good. So we need more of that, and we need more of these kind of meetings to meet your, your needs for that. Um, and unfortunately in the US, the people go to the grocery store, and they're very, very distant from the, from the farmers. But there's an effort now to bring them closer 
uh, to, to understand where their food's coming from because the environmental damage that's coming with intensive agriculture can't be tolerated anymore. Yeah, you said there's a competition between uh, feeding the world and, sequest and uh, to sequest uh, the, the carbon. Um, is there any uh, special biological law or something that prevents from increasing the capacity of the soil to, uh, uh, to, sequest to sequestrate more uh, carbon? Uh, meanwhile, you can feed the world. Uh, an excellent question. And it boils down to something that maybe is very, very simple in terms of trying to maximize capturing the sunlight energy. Even in the wintertime here in France, there's some energy that's wasted. And we need to force ourselves to maximize that option. And th we, we have a, s Mother Nature gives us a certain capacity. And right now, we're not at 100% capacity in terms of capturing carbon, capturing energy. But we have to learn to work within the biological limitations so that we can develop plants that will grow under drier conditions or cooler conditions or whatever ones that we need to maximize the capture of, the, of this carbon uh, energy. That's the short answer. And how we do that, you young minds are going to have to do some of the thinking and, and uh, take that as a challenge. The fact that you're here, you've taken the first step in terms of showing interest in at least what I think is the most important part is understanding carbon management. Carbon in, in agriculture has been sort of a freebie. And it's only in the last 10 years when we started talking about the health and appreciating the soil biology that carbon is coming as a nutritional thing. You all understand fertility of N, P, and K. And that's been around for a long time. And from my perspective, in terms of understanding a biological system, carbon is much more important than N, P, and K in this whole system. It's, it's not all of the, uh, the benefits, but it's something that we need to learn and understand better. And we are doing that. And so uh, we must, must continue to increase the rate of training and education. And I'm honored to be a part of that. And I hope that you will take some of this message home and share it with your friends and your politician friends and so forth. So um, thanks for giving me an opportunity to <laughs> say what, uh, what I uh, want to say and, and want to believe. And I hope I can convince you, all of you, to um, develop that same attitude. So OK, so part of the reason that I'm here is uh, I did a little bit of research on tillage-induced carbon dioxide loss. And I, I, I would like to tell you that it was because I'm a very smart man that we found this, but the only thing I did was teach my technician how to calibrate a very complex analyzer to measure carbon dioxide loss. And uh, it's totally by accident we found this, but uh, when you plow the soil, there's a large burp of carbon dioxide that comes out, and that amount of carbon dioxide emissions is proportional to the volume of soil disturbed. So when you have no-till with minimum soil disturbance, there's a very, very small amount that comes out. But if you have strip-till, forms of uh, conservation tillage, and some with residue cover on it, you get a larger and larger amount of carbon dioxide coming out. And the maximum is with a, a moldboard plow about 25 centimeters deep. And so uh, we'll talk more about that. And, and basically, this part is my, my only claim to fame as a, as a scientist. So uh, we can relate to what's going on in, the, in our human development or human evolution. And so uh, there's people that have made estimates on what the carbon was that we've lost from the soils. Um, it turns out to be about 500 gigatons of CO2 based on this one, one estimate. So as this organic matter decreases in the soils, 
we're facing more damage from erosion, uh, heat waves and droughts and other climate extremes, and it becomes a more vicious cycle. And uh, Adamir Caligari had that vicious cycle. And this was what happens in, in a, sometimes in a natural system. So, um, in the U.S., it started back in the 1930s with the, with the Dust Bowl, and that started the conservation movement. And so we're still trying to understand what we can do to manage the soil better. And from an engineering perspective, uh, building structures has helped, building terraces has helped, but it's only now with the soil health movement and soil biology that we are getting a better handle on working and collaborating with Mother Nature's. So, um, soil erosion and degradations, a uh, tremendous problem. And David Pimito is a scientist at the University of Minnesota and said that as a result of erosion over the past 40 years, 30% of the world's arable land has become unproductive. And with an expanding population, we can't afford to lose any of that resource because we're not going to have enough land, enough resources to produce food in a sustainable manner when we hit a population about 9.5 billion. And so the first visible symptom of the degradation is, is, is erosion. You, I mean, if you, if you don't look, you won't see it, but it's there. And, but that's only part of the damage that's been being done when you understand that the invisible biology are disrupted and uh, having, having trouble trying to do what they're supposed to do for maintaining our system. So uh, these are some of the consequences of loss of soil organic matter that are repeated, um, are, are a result of repeated soil tillage. Uh, when you till the soil a lot and leave it bare, you get more chances of water runoff and sediment loss. And the input energy in form of fossil fuel or fertilizers or pesticides increases. So with intensive tillage, there's other things you can do to offset some of the negative effects of tillage, but the input costs just go continually up and uh, it's going away from the way Mother Nature would do it. Um, we can decrease the capacity for capture and release of the carbon and the plant nutrients in the, in the uh, soil, finding some way to maintain it in that. We can uh, decrease the soil quality and the biopores uh, that are a consequence of, of the tillage and that um, modifies the, the rooting environment. As a result, if we lose that organic matter, we're going to get decreasing yields. Uh, as we've been talking all morning, we decrease the activity and the diversity of the soil organisms. And the resigns, uh, the, the, we get decreased reliance on the soil plant atmosphere system to help uh, provide the resilience we need for some of the climate extremes that we are experiencing. So we need to start considering how to change the input-out ratios of our, our systems uh, that indicate these decreased efficiencies and, and use the um, uh, and the use of inputs so that we can minimize any any subsequent pollution. Uh, we uh, get this increased risk of sustainability and food security from conventional tillage agriculture and uh, the associated in environmental degradation. It's a long list of things that tell you we should not be tilling the soil intensively. One example of this is shown on this next slide. And Apple doesn't like my slides. But this is some long-term data from two experiment stations in the US. The top lines with the open circles is from the uh, University of Illinois in, in central Illinois, in the middle of the Corn Belt. And the other set is from the uh, Sanborn field plots in, in um, central Missouri. On the y-axis is the percent carbon in the soil, and on the x-axis is time starting from 1880 here 
and going over to 2,000 on the other, uh, other end. And so the, the point I want to make is that the, the, the open circles is a corn, uh, oats, and hay rotation. And while it's in the hay rotation, there's no tillage because it was a perennial crop. And so we get the least decline and the least loss at the end of the period when they were making the measurements. On the other hand, the open triangles are a continuous corn, plowed and disked every year. And you can see you've got the most rapid decline, and it ends up with the lowest value at the end of the measurement period, out about 2,000. So that tells us something about the system and the cropping system that we're looking at. A similar relationship holds for the Missouri data. The treatments are just slightly different, but it boils down to, from my perspective, to being related to the amount of tillage that's taken place. And so I end up with this summary of what intensive agriculture has done in terms of the soil organic matter decline over, over the long term. And the thing that I learned from that previous slide is that cropping systems can make a difference. So we look at the possible explanations for the soil carbon decline. And uh, the first one is that we have carbon removed, carbon exported from the field as a result of taking the grain off and us eating it or feeding it to the animals. This is about a third of the carbon fixed in that, uh, in that system. The second possible explanation is intensive tillage, the moldboard plow and the disc harrow that was used till about the last 30 or 40 years in, in the US. The third possible explanation is that we have changed from perennial species in the, uh, in the virgin soils with um, uh, perennial grasses that put 60 to 90% of their biomass below ground as compared to our annual agronomic species, species that only put 15 to 20% of their biomass below ground. So we're putting less carbon in with our agronomic species. The fourth factor is the increase in the organic matter mineralization. That's a result of higher, larger amounts of inorganic nitrogen fertilizers that enhances this mineralization. And too much nitrogen on that system speeds up that process, and the population of microbes get geared up and expands, and eventually the resource becomes limited, and then they will go down. But while they're doing that, they take and utilize more carbon than they really need because of the extra nitrogen that's there. The uh, fifth possible factor at least in the Midwest U.S., is, is tile drainage as a result of increased soil aeration that might reduce the carbon a little bit. So there are five possible factors, and I would be interested in your response as to which one you think is the largest contributor to the decrease in carbon in the soil. M my biases and my research shows that intensive tillage with a moldboard plow I have no data for what the change in perennial species are other than what other people have told me. But the, the two of those things, I think, are the primary contributors to the decrease in carbon in, in all of our agricultural soils. The synthetic fertilizers makes a contribution, but I think it's small. And if, if drainage has any effect at all, it would be small. And the other part that I'm still wrestling with is that in a natural system, Mother Nature doesn't export any carbon. And here we are having the human need for food and fiber and energy. And we develop a technique using agriculture to grow that plant and take away some of the carbon from the ecosystem that it was grown in. And one of the things that I think is happening now is that the advent of the cover crops are going a long way to replace that carbon that we export when we take the, the grain yield off and either feed it to cattle or chickens or pigs or ourselves. And so we have to find some way, and uh, Claire Chenu mentioned this in her presentation, 
and she says we need 45% more carbon put into the system than we're doing now to offset this, to come back closer to a natural system. Well, I come up with this value of a third, and I don't want to argue about the difference between a third and 45%. It's the principle, and we need to find some way to quantify that so that we can make some definitive statement. So, intensive tillage and change in species, I think, are some of the biggest factors. So, <coughs> intensive tillage um, leads to all forms of soil carbon loss. And the challenge with tillage and the carbon dioxide is that carbon dioxide is colorless, it's odorless, it's tasteless. You cannot see it, feel it, or touch it. So you can't perceive that there's a problem. But if you look at that cloud of dust behind the implement, you can see that dust, you can feel that dust, you can taste that dust, you can perceive some type of wind erosion. And I use that analogy to uh, try to get you to understand. To measure the concentration of, of CO2 in water vapor, it takes a very expensive infrared gas analyzer that measures it down into tenths of parts per million. And the, the challenging in people to understand it is there's no visible evidence that it's happening. Well, you know when, the, when the, you till a soil and you see moisture there, and then six hours later it'll start to dry off, you can see some visible evidence of that. But during that same time, there's this large burp of carbon dioxide that goes out of the soil as a result of intensive tillage. So intensive tillage releases this invisible, uh, large amount of invisible CO2 that's analogous to this cloud of dust. And I hope that you will take the measurements that I show you and, and understand that there is something happening there, and that's, that's why it's happening. So. There is a, it's difficult to, um, to talk about no tillage uh, still at EU level. Uh, people have the feeling, in fact, uh, the tillage is a birth of agriculture. And when you say no tillage is a contradiction, completely uh, strong contradiction mm -hmm. with the, the past first. And there is still uh, uh, people who argue on the fact there is a need of uh, plowing up uh, in uh, some uh, Nordic country. Uh, for them, it's important uh, to uh, plow and to improve the structure of the soil. I, I have been faced with that question with through 40 years of my career. And if you have the attitude that it's not going to work and there's nothing happening, nothing will happen. But I, I know there's people at 62 degrees north latitude in Finland, one or two farmers that make no-till work. And I understand that the university people have data to show that no-till doesn't work. And I'm supposed to be visiting with some equipment dealer coming here to this meeting, and he wants to understand why the university people can't show any difference. Well, I think part of the explanation is, and I want to talk with him more about it, is that with no-till and no other form of carbon input in terms of the, the, the corn or soybeans or wheat is not enough to increase the carbon content. And I think if they find some way to sneak a cover crop in there for two or three weeks or a month on the spring and the ahead of the agronomic crop and in the fall, they're gonna start to see some differences. No-till by itself many times does not result in an increased carbon because as I, as I indicated, the, the, the uh, the, the biomass of, of corn and soybeans that only put 15% of the biomass below ground. And compared to the perennial system, but put 60 to 90% of the biomass below ground. So uh, we've wrestled with this, and there's a lot of debate going on, and um, uh, it, it bothers me as a scientist when people take and use this powerful tool called meta-analysis and they come up and say they got 6,000 data samples and said, well, that shows no, 
no increase in carbon in no-till. Well, um, I, I could go on for a half hour on, on the problems there, but I, I will, if we, we can wait till after we're done to get through this, and then we'll talk about that, because it's a social issue rather than a technical issue. And the social issue is the gray matter between someone's ears has turned to gray concrete in terms of what they think is happening. And, uh, and I will give you my biases. So I, <laughs> I appreciate the question, and I could talk on that for two hours if we could. Je voulais intervenir. Euh, Aujourd'hui, en France, le discours, c'est de dire euh, comment on va nourrir la population en 2050. Et moi, je n'apprécie pas du tout ce, ce style de, de présentation. C'est en 2050, pour moi, qu'est-ce qui restera comme sol pour nourrir la planète Et j'aimerais mieux entendre ce genre de choses, parce qu'en fin de compte, quand on voit le, la, la, la première manière de le présenter, c'est de dire aux agriculteurs, continuez à intensifier, continuez à travailler, à produire, et euh, le sol, ce n'est pas un souci. Et moi, c'est catastrophique. J'habite euh, où j'habite, j'ai une rivière. Le 2018, on a eu des gros orages. C'était des torrents de boue. Moi, j'ai vu les sols partir. Et ça, je me disais, continuons, continuons. Et demain, oui, en 2050, on va avoir un problème pour nourrir la planète. Hein. It, it is a very major problem, and I appreciate the, the, the point that you make. Uh, you must have some soil tra science training somewhere along the line because we have to understand that it takes anywhere between 700 and 1500 years to make 2.5 centimeters of soil. And we are losing soil faster than Mother Nature is making it in all of our conventionally tilled agriculture systems. And it's being lost by erosion. In our case, it goes down the Mississippi River through the middle of our country and de is deposited out in the, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. And all the nitrates and the phosphate and the algae that are there because of excess fertilizer application is contributing to the degradation of that uh, source of, of fish for, um, for, for seafood. So uh, if we don't protect the soil, we're not going to have food security. It's just that simple because we have finite amount of soil and environmental conditions where we can produce the food that we need. And with the climate extremes that we are experiencing, we've got to find some way to put more resilience into that system because <laughs> we have rain showers of 300 millimeters in 10 hours. <coughs> Excuse me. And we get major flooding. And in, uh, uh -oh. I, th I think in inches, we had one storm, one hurricane over Houston, Texas, in, in th three days, dumped 50 inches is, um, two and a half. what's that, 100 and 1,500 millimeters? Okay, thank you for the conversion, I appreciate that. Uh, and it's happening with more frequency and higher intensity. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, anyway, uh, don't get me started on that because <laughs> it's, that, that we have climate deniers in the U.S., and I assume you have some here, but um, uh, without the climate, we're not gonna produce the food. Without soil, we're not gonna produce the food. And so we got to learn to put the whole system together to put in re resilience on that. So uh, if we can get back on track a little bit, we can talk about what tillage does to decrease the water use efficiency. And again, I've got this shopping list of what decreases water use efficiency and a shopping list of what decreases soil health. And I could probably go through that list and tell you them, but uh, I provide a copy of the, uh, the PowerPoint presentation and you would have to help someone help you translate it, but th there's many, many things that tillage does to decrease water use efficiency in terms of uh, the, the, the soil disturbance. We have monoculture systems. We have a minimum diversity in many of our systems. It 
Tillage results in decreased infiltration and increased runoff. Uh, it decreases any nutrient storage. It plant available water is because it runs off, it's not going in, and, and any storage that we get down there, it's limited because there are tillage pans in the profile that do not allow the roots to penetrate deeper into that. Bare soil increases evaporation, the tillage decreases the biopores, and uh, decreases soil porosity, and, and in effect decreases the rooting depth. So um, I just hope I can convince you that tillage is not very good for increasing water use efficiency. And uh, I'll be happy to talk to you more about it rather than belaboring this, uh, uh, this, this issue. <coughs> So I'm going to talk a little bit more about tillage, and I feel like I'm running out of time, so if I can skip the questions on this one and hope that we'll get some more on the next one. This, from my perspective and my biases, the number one environmental enemy in production agriculture is this convention, the conventional tillage that promotes the soil organic matter oxidation and soil degradation. And so I have these flames that are supposed to be flickering, representing a slow oxidation, a slow burning of the carbon, taking it from carbon, uh, the element, and adding two oxygen to make CO2 that goes out, and that's invisible to us. So the tillage changes the oxygen concentration from anywhere from 14 to 15 percent under consolidated soil to 21 percent, and at 21 percent, uh, of oxygen coming into the system is a little bit like pouring gasoline on the fire. It speeds up the oxidation process and those flames get a little bit larger and, and the flickering. So, and from my perspective, that carbon going out of the soil is like money going out of the soil because it costs something to bring that carbon in and the, uh, the other one's a similar picture that I had before. So I discovered this tillage-induced carbon loss, and I'm going to try to convince you that it's something that's real that we've got to be um, uh, concerned about. And so my puffs of carbon dioxide, well, there they go. Uh, and I've listed all of the things that this tillage does to the system, and the main one that I want to talk about is the carbon loss and the biodiversity loss. And these other things I think you can catch off of the... Uh, off of the slides when you have a chance to, to look at it in detail. So uh, I do this to try to give you a sense of how these plumes of carbon dioxide that you cannot see are actually going out and what, what's causing the decrease in soil carbon. Donc, euh, qu'est-ce que font euh, les politiques euh, américaines pour, euh, pour encourager, donc, euh, la cap le, enfin, pour limiter euh, l'évaporation euh, de carbone et pour encourager euh, la captation de carbone Uh, my mother <coughs> was very important in my life, and she made it clear to me, growing up and as a scientist, that I do not talk about religion and politics. But my short answer is, <laughs> the political situation in the U.S. is in dire need of change. And... Uh, it's not very good, and I'm here to learn what Stefan Fall has done to continue his efforts in helping farmers get carbon in the soil, because it's one of the longest initiatives that I'm aware of, and I hope it's still making progress. And, and, uh, but in the U.S., I'm, I'm, I'm considered a... Um, I'm considered an outlaw or, or something to that effect that, that because that many of the farmers don't believe in it. And they say, well, it's just the normal changes we're going through. Well, the data shows more variability, more extremes, and more damage. And with the forest fires we have in California, followed by heavy rainfall events, we had one, one event where 22 people were killed because the soil's coming down the canyons just ran right over their house and, and uh, resulted in their death. And we had people die in our hurricanes, and eh, it's okay. Well, 
I don't know that we can do anything immediately, but we have to start doing a little bit now and a little bit more later and on and on to address some of these issues. Um, I'm sorry to say that <laughs> our political situation is uh, not very good. And um, can I just leave it at that? So, okay. Can we go back to science? That's a social issue, and it's a, and it's a serious one. And so I don't want to belittle it, but um, I, I've fought this for 35 years, and I get thick-skinned and hard head, and so it's, um, I get emotional blahs too, so. <laughs> okay, so back to science. Uh, we developed this portable chamber system. <coughs> which we gave the name Mr. Gem, which in English stands for Mobile Research Gas Exchange Machine. It's nothing but a high clearance forklift that we've mounted this box on the front, a clear plastic box, mainly to measure photosynthesis. And we were measuring photosynthesis and trying to characterize how fast a corn plant dies in a killing frost. And my technician, was taught to calibrate when he starts and calibrate at the end. Well, in the end calibration, if the concentration of the atmosphere was about 350 parts per million, then, then it was probably okay. Well, this day that he was doing that, it was 410 parts per million. And so he brought the tractor up to the lab and I went out and I calibrated it. And there, the ambient CO2 was 355 parts per million. So I thought, well, okay, well, maybe there's something wrong. The very next day, he went down to make the measurements again, <coughs> and when he got there, the, uh, the CO2 concentration was a little bit high, but not, not too bad. Anyway, he made the measurements, and when he complete the measurements for the day, the CO2 concentration was up to 420 parts per million. So I go down to the field and made measurements on a bear plot where we had reference for, to know what comes out of a, of a bear soil. We keep it re weed free and, and so forth. And those measurements were good. The measurements we got with a dying plant were what we expected. And when I calibrated it, I got 420 parts per million. Well, I'm never wrong, so <laughs> I didn't know what was going on. So we're standing around there trying to figure why the analyzer was giving this high value of carbon dioxide. And I turned and over in the field, coming from the upwind portion, was a guy going with a tractor plowing. And they were plowing there the previous day. So we went and measured with this chamber where it was plowed 24 hours ago. And normally, when we measure plant photosynthesis, the, the needle will just sort of go very, very slow. And the computer's collecting that data to make calculations once a second. So we went over on this soil that was plowed 24 hours ago, and the needle on the thing, we repeated it 10 times. And then I said, well, let's go over where the fresh plowed land. And so we know we have to be careful with, with um, equipment and people because we can tell if there's a person breathing out there and, and if it's upwind of the chamber. So we, we already know that and, and so we have to do that. So we went over there and after the tractor went by, we come in and drop the chamber. It went that fast. Repeated it 10 times and then the light went off about this invisible carbon dioxide coming out of the soil. So. Uh, totally by accident, but it does, at least in my mind, explain a lot of what's, what's happening. So I use those plumes from our ethanol plant to give you some idea of the kind of gas exchange that's taken place because I told you that you can't see the, uh, the carbon dioxide. Sometimes when it's cold, you can see water vapor as, as a little bit of fog, but to give you some idea of the gas exchange process that's taking place. So one of the first experiments we did, we went on and we had a, a no-till treatment where we ran the equipment through there to get the same amount of compaction. Then we had 
One with a, what had a fluted culture to loosen the soil, <coughs> about 76 millimeters deep. Then we had one with a fertilizer knife that gave a, a V-shaped form of soil loosening. Then we had one that was what we called the mole knife that had more of a U-shaped volume. And then we had a low subsoil, dis low disturbance subsoil shank that went down 350 millimeters. And we compared that with the mole board plow. So the tillage implement would be pulled by a tractor through the plot. We would come in immediately after, drop the chamber, and make three repetitive measurements to get that. And then we would go to another location to repeat the, the tillage to give us four replications. And then but we did that with each one of those, um, those types of tillage. And so I, I hope you get an idea of what they look like. And um, so when we take a look at that and measure on the y-axis, which is the cumulative loss of carbon dioxide, on the left-hand side, it's supposed to be within five hours after tillage. And on the right-hand side, it's 24 hours. So our numbers are different. Um, because of the longer time interval. So I'm just sorry that that's not coming through on this, but um, uh, you can see that this is the moldboard plow, this is subsoil shank, this is the, uh, the uh, fertilizer knife with the, with the mold knife, the fertilizer thing, the strip till, which is the disc, and here's no till. And so there's a little bit of CO2 that's emitted from the no till because there's residue on the surface, and some of it just is coming out of the soil very slowly. And so when you take a look at that relationship for an interval of five hours after tillage, we get the same relationship with 24 hours after tillage. And you can see that, yes, we get some CO2 out of the no-till. Anyway, when we started to think about that and plot some of the data, you can see that there's a substantial amount that comes out with the moldboard plow. And I'm sorry that you can't see the numbers, but if you do it on a PC at home, I'm, I hope that it'll come out nice and clear. Anyway, if you take a look at this slide where we've plotted the cumulative loss of CO2 on the y-axis versus the volume of soil disturbed in the tillage operation, what we did was went in and measured the profile so we could get the cross-sectional area of the soil disturbance. And if we assume a unit length down the row, then we can convert that to a volume. And so what this shows is that no-till was down in here, the strip till, uh, two types of fertilizer, the subsoil shank, and way up there is a moldboard plow, and a value of 0.97 for an R-squared is pretty good in terms of like, so basically that's telling us that the cumulative gas emissions from tillage equipment is proportional to the volume of soil disturbed. And so you that drive that big tractor also understand that the diesel consumption is proportional to that energy and, and required to do that, that tillage. And so it becomes a double negative from from my perspective. Carbon lost from the soil, carbon lost from the diesel fuel consumed to till the soil. Et euh, est-ce que vous avez fait un rapport avec euh, la production donc euh, produit, produite the, the short answer is no. We were just making the measurements to characterize the CO2 from the um, CO2 loss from the, from the soil. And to get the differences I think you're alluding to we would have to, some of these soils have been tilled for 100, 120, 130 years, and we're still getting good yields because we're putting in some fertilizer. But I showed you some of the decline in soil organic matter, and if we didn't put in more fertilizer, we didn't use some pesticides on those, we wouldn't be getting the yields that we are. And so there's, there's no way that I can relate this to yields, other than to say that it's, loss and, and if somebody else makes a measurement on the, on the yield related to the organic matter content, um, that's a real challenge because in the upper 20 or 30 centimeters in many of our soils, we have high uh, carbon content.
but from the bottom one meter of the profile, there's only a small amount of carbon, but we still have roots that are down there penetrating that, taking up water and, and nutrients. And so I'm not sure how we could do an experiment to um, answer your particular question about whether the thing is going to um, uh, be proportional to the yield, whether the yield would be inversely proportional to the, um, to the carbon loss. My, my intuitive feeling is that if we did it long enough, we would eventually see the decline on organic matter that would also be related to, the yields would be related to the decline on organic matter. Um, we, we have some of the similar problems in, in the U.S. with, uh, with no-till, but th some of the same farmers that have a organic matter content of 2% of, of, uh, carbon, they can get very high yields as the same one, similar ones that have 4 to 5% carbon. And so it's difficult to attribute the difference, any differences in yield just to the carbon content because carbon is only one part of it. And when you look at the cycling and the nutrients and the biology and temperature and the timing of all that, uh, it, it's very complex. Okay, so um, I mentioned about the importance of diesel fuel. Uh, my colleague Dave Archer did uh, a little bit of work coming up with some calculations to show that uh, the diesel fuel is proportional to the volume of soil disturbed, and we call that that tillage intensity. So it becomes a double negative, and um, so we have to start understanding what's going on to our system. So we, we did several experiments and, and basically got the same results um, in, in terms of the quantitative measurements. And so we had an opportunity to go out and measure the CO2 emissions following two different no-till drills. And we had, one was a, what I call a low disturbance opener with a single disc or double disc opener, and one that has a tine opener that I call a high disturbance. They're both called no-till drills. And the, the, you can see the difference in the, in the picture of the surface. The low disturbance drill has a little more crop residue on the surface. But the high disturbance drill has incorporated some of that as part of the tillage that takes place with that type of, of high disturbance drill. If you take a look at the field perspective of it, on the complete left side, you can see what the non-disturbed area is. And then you can see the, the line for the low disturbance. And here's the high disturbance. There is a disc harrow. And on the extreme right is the moldboard plow. Well, the difference between the low disturbance and the high disturbance results in a substantial amount of carbon dioxide loss that's shown on here. The, the first two lines, uh, Apple and I aren't going to get along very well. This is the uh, no disturbance, it's just a native system. This is the low disturbance drill, and this is the high disturbance drill. The water was not as much as we thought it would be, but because of the low disturbance, maybe it didn't reach into that. But with the high disturbance drill, we got substantial amounts of water and carbon dioxide released, even though they're called no-till drills. And the only reason I present that is to let you know the satisfaction the science gets from finding small differences it gave me some satisfaction that the technique was working because we could measure these small differences when both of them were no-till drills. So uh, the people that are talking about shallow tillage, that's a lot better than deep tillage. But you have to understand that there's fungi that are in that shallow layer. There's a lot of microbes that are there. And every time you till that, even if it's shallow, you break up the fungal network that's important to us in terms of helping the plant get phosphorus, helping the plant get water when they're, when they're stressed conditions. So um, the, the, the shape of the volume disturbed uh, apparently was not, not that critical, but it's more directly related to the volume of soil disturbed. And if you... Um, want to minimize the carbon loss, you just have to minimize 
the volume of soil disturbed. So, in addition to this carbon loss, intensive tillage butchers the biology in the soil. It cuts and slices and dices the soil and blends and mix and inverts the uh, soil, creating havoc for the soil biology. We go from this sort of a fantasy situation, which is more natural, but it's, it's, it's a little bit hypothetical. But after a primary tillage, we get some breakup and larger clods in the soil. And then with a secondary tillage, uh, we get an additional small amount of CO2 as we further break down the clods. But the small amount with the, uh, the undisturbed system uh, is just there, and that's just a natural rate of going it. But after a primary tillage, we get a large amount. And then with secondary tillage, it decreases a little bit as a result of what the tillage has done to the soil biology and how it's recompacted uh, the soil and uh, left it fractured. So <coughs> I'm sure that um, you've probably seen the seagulls that come around following the tillage implement. The upper picture was provided to me by uh, uh, Soren Ilso from Denmark, and uh, the seagulls are there for a reason. They're picking up the worms and the grubs and the insects that are brought up to the thing, and I'd like to provide the analogy that this intensive tillage opens the all-you-can-eat buffet for the birds and the microbe. This extra oxygen that comes into the system works on the carbon in terms of oxidizing it, and um, not only and it disrupts the uh, the uh, biological activity of the of the worms. And this is a picture I collected from Minnesota. So something's happened to the soil biology, or those birds wouldn't be there. So we have this twin problems in terms of accelerated accelerated degradation, as indicated by the birds there eating all the the biology, but it also opens the soil up for more erosion and we just can't afford to lose that soil. So from my perspective, the uh, tillage creates a, a battlefield for the soil biology that is supposed to be working for us, trying to help us produce food and fiber for ourselves and for future generations. And so I had a friend from Brazil that had this uh, quote that intensive tillage is a bad case of iron toxicity. And uh, because it leads to more erosion, changes in the air permeability, it, it changes from a diffusively controlled system to a convective flow system. The rapid gas exchange takes place because of destroying the soil structure. And so from that, uh, the bottom line is intensive tillage leads to all forms of soil carbon loss. And unfortunately, you can't see it, but uh, with sophisticated measurements and equipment, you can measure and quantify it, though. So in our natural systems, nature only rarely turns the land upside down and current during, uh, during current disasters. And the whole point of plowing is to kill whatever's happening in the living system in the soil. So in the upper left-hand corner, the 10 bottom plow, takes about, um, I don't know how you express horsepower, but 550 horsepower to pull that plow through the soil and uh, results in all these negative things in terms of killing the plants and that. And we have one celebration in our area where they brought out three of these oil-burning diesel tractors to pull 50 plows wide across the field and everybody was excited, and, and all I could see was carbon coming out of the soil, and, and, uh, and I, I couldn't talk to them because the, the, the cultural thing about breaking up the prairie was still very fresh in their minds, and uh, that was more important. There's one of the farmers that we worked with with the picture in the right, and uh, this, to me, is a better place for the plows to be in that Memorial, we have one conservation farmer that put the plow where it needs to be in terms of a memorial thing. So anyway, um, I, I look for, for evidence to show the social concern 
or the lack of social concern and what's going on in that system. So from my perspective, tillage is a biotic disturbance, and I like to talk about the turmoil of tillage. The, if you look at the soil as a natural living system that contains a lot of life, when it's tilled intensively, it's dramatically changed. And it can be considered analogous to a human reaction to an earthquake, a forest fire, a hurricane, an asteroid impact, a tsunami, and a tornado, all rolled in to one perturbation event. And if that happened to you in your home once or twice or three times a year, you would not be very happy. You would want to move on and find some better place to carry out your life's function. And so understanding that we're working with a biological system, tillage does everything to destroy that biology. Uh, it doesn't destroy it completely because we're still, we've been you know, doing it for several years, but it still uh, results in some degradation that we're still trying to understand. So tillage is a physical, chemical, and biological apocalypse. It destroys the structure, the infrastructure, the organisms, and it will eventually destroy our food security. Uh, intensive tillage is an ecological Armageddon for all the soil organisms. So, um, one of the things that I have concern about is the term conservation tillage, and I'm not sure what terminology you use here, but conservation tillage represents all forms of tillage that leaves a little bit of residue on the surface. And so it goes from <coughs> anything from in here in terms of a deep river because there's soil uh, residue, uh, residue on the soil, all the way over here to slot tillage and, and uh, no-till with a high disturbance and a low disturbance thing. And everything in between is called conservation tillage. And some people call it no-till because they think conservation means no-till. This is in the US. Anyway, I don't like the term of conservation tillage because I think it's an oxymoron in that the, it has contrasting or opposite meanings when you say conservation and tillage. Because in my view, there's no conservation with any kind of tillage. Quelles sont les proportions euh, de travail euh, du sol euh, dans, le, dans votre état Oh, okay, the, the, the amount of acres of, of no-till or conservation agriculture and conventional. We, we uh, on, on an average for the, the center part of the country, about 37% of the land is in no-till. And the remainder is still in conventional. But conventional does not necessarily mean moldboard plow. Many people are using the deep ripper uh, as a form of conventional tillage because they can go faster and turn sharper without having that. Uh, th 37% is in, approximately 37% is in no-till. Yes, we have a lot of farmers that give me white hair because of tillage. And my attitude is it's a, it's a cultural thing and it's, it's um, habit. My grandfather did it, he was successful. My father did it, he was successful. I will do it and be successful. And that logic works because of the resilience in the soil that we already have. But the soil has limits. And we are rapidly approaching, when I showed that water, the carbon content, we are approaching the limits of before the whole system is going to start to degrade and um, and uh, provide some real challenges in, in maintaining crop production. Okay? Thank you for that. So, so uh, for you people who know till, uh, from my perspective, no tillage is, oh crap, not the miracle manage, right? because no till minimizes the carbon loss. And when we talk about conservation agriculture systems, that system is effective because it requires a simultaneously a functioning of these three principles and the principles of the diversity and the rotation of cover crops uh, and the crop residue on the surface all contribute to 
a better environment from the soil biology. So <clears throat> when you look at this disturbance continuum going from maximum disturbance on the left with conventional tillage, we get zero conservation and much tillage. With conservation tillage, we get some conservation and some tillage. But with the direct seeding or no-till, we get a lot of conservation and zero tillage. And this is why we need to be working in that direction in all of our pub, um, production systems. So the, uh, the two most common related factors are the erosion and the depletion of organic matter. And so to me, this is a significant threat to global soils. And we're all in this boat together. And so we got to develop a global perspective. And I'm, again, I'm, I'm hopeful that your four for 1,000 initiative is the one of the first steps in generating that global network. And I understand there's going to be a meeting in Boston sometime this fall where they're trying to expand the global network based on the four for 1,000 initiative. Uh, we got land use changes taking place, and there's a lot of things that are negative with that because we've upset the apple cart for Mother Nature. Mother Nature doesn't like to be disturbed, and in our agriculture production systems, we do everything to rip up the soil and aggravate Mother Nature. So with our conservation agriculture system, we're trying to mimic Mother Nature, and we can look at the soil health benefits of nature's plow, that is the taproot and, and the earthworms, as opposed to the soil degradation with man's plow. Uh, we're understanding better what's causing that, but we still have some farmers that really enjoy what we call recreational tillage. The guy that's got the largest stack of diesel smoke going out as he's going across the field has the most pride in doing the most destruction, even though he doesn't realize what's happening to that. So. Uh, th there's these cultural things that we have to consider. So we have plenty of examples of uh, erosion in our part of the world. And what I want you to sh uh, show you over here in this corner is we have the black soil on top of white snow. And when the soil is bare with no residue cover on the surface, it freeze dries in the fall and a little bit of wind gives wind erosion, and so they have a slang expression that that acronym that describes that is called SNERT. It's snow plus dirt. Well, as a soil scientist, that's a four-letter word that I, I don't like. And so I go to coffee with a group we call the Rusty Zippers, and they got that name because they drink a lot of coffee and talk and talk. And one man was 80, 88 years old, and I told him the dilemma, and he says, why don't you call it snoil? And so I give him credit for coining a new word, the combination of snow and soil, and it's got scientific meaning rather than the slang expression of snurt. And a un point important, ce dernier, ces dernières photos, parce que euh, c'est ce que disent les Scandinaves, ils disent que chez eux, euh, il faut labourer et il y a la neige de toute façon et le gel qui est là et il n'y a pas besoin de changer les choses. Well, if it's frozen, when it's solid with ice on it, but uh, it, it will not. But in our case, we have such low humidities that it freeze dries. And through the process of sublimation, that water goes out, and when that water goes out, the structure breaks down, and the wind starts pushing the soil particles across and get pulverized. And we have times when the visibility is down because of the snow or soil blowing across the road. Um, that's just, just the way it is. And it, it doesn't happen very often. There are times, maybe two or three times a year, eh, yeah, there's a little bit of soil loss, but Every little bit that we lose, <laughs> it's going to take 700 to 1,500 years to replace it. OK, fungi to bacteria ratio. Um, I will carry on through that. Uh, soil health, I've already talked about that. Um, the, the soil biology is so important 
that they, they uh, play a role in the transformation of the organic matter into nutrients. And they're responsible for between 85 and 90 percent of the total soil metabolism due to microbial activity. And that's one reason for that uh, to, to protect and, and uh, maintain the soil biology activity. Uh, the soil fungi are our friends. And there's about 3,000 different species around the place. And, uh, but there, there's all kinds of characterization that goes on with them. But the fungi are the most sensitive to any type of tillage. And if you understand the fragile network of those uh, filaments, you'll understand why they're, they break and are the, the function is set back. So the fungi are important because they decompose complex form of the carbon compounds and some of the more recalcitrant materials. And they also provide this thing called glomalin that's important in uh, making the, the glue for holding the aggregates together. So I want you to understand that tillage creates this priming effect for some microbes, but it does a complete destruction for the fungal hyphae network on that. So we would like to have a large fungi to bacteria ratio because it's been documented that we get more carbon and nitrogen storage. And this is one of the things that can contribute to that carbon to nitrogen ratio for us. So if we want to store more carbon and nitrogen within the soil for subsequent crops, we must try to maximize this carbon, this fungi to bacteria ratio, which means virtually no soil disturbance in the way that tillage destroys it. And there's a few literature citations that, that there to back up that statement. That glomalin, if you look at it on the y-axis, it's the uh, glomalin content of the soil versus time in, in terms of no tillage. And this was uh, done by a colleague of Sarah Wright. So when there's um, starting off with the tillage, the value of 0.7 uh, when it was plowed every year. And into the first year of no-till, it increases to 1.3. In the third year, it's up to 1.7. And up to 15 years with no-till, uh, it values up to 2.7. And so we, that's one of the things we need to take into consideration because that glomalin is the number one glue in holding the soil particles together to form aggregates. Soil biology. Okay, so the, the potential benefits from the cover crops are the cover crop carbon is put in. And I just, I can't say that enough because um, it seems to be the one of the best ways that, that some of our pioneer farmers are, sh are showing now to, to get that increase. And uh, we just need to understand that. So we look at this organic matter and it, it functions when it is decayed and destroyed, releasing some of the nutrients. And this is a quote from William Albrecht back a few years ago. But we take that crop biomass that's about 45% carbon, it's decomposed, releasing CO2 to the atmosphere, nutrients into the soil for the next plants, and we end up with soil organic matter that's about 58% carbon. And so when we look at I don't know what Apple's doing to my thing, but um, we, get, we get this release of these nutrients, and the difference between 45% carbon and 58% carbon is about 13%, in this case, uh, of mass. That mass is made up of many of these macro and micronutrients that become available in the, uh, um, from the, the biomass. Now, there's some carbon and hydrogen and oxygen in that, but there's all these macro and micronutrients that become available as part of this natural fertility system. J'aurais une question par rapport à l'impact du carbone sur le pH, sur l'acidité du sol. Most of the time, the carbon will act as a buffer to dramatic pH changes. Uh, the biggest thing that contributes to pH changes in our case is we have calcium carbonate in the subsoil very close to the surface. And when you get to pH 8.2, that's too high for most agronomic plants. Um, the carbon can buffer some of that effect, but it's, it's, um, 
uh, not, not one of the direct controls of the, um, the, the pH. It can buffer it a little bit, but it's not the, it will not be the determining factor for the magnitude of the pH. And here I come back to talk a little bit about the carbon to nitrogen ratio, and we beat that around a little bit earlier, so I'm, I'm not going to uh, say too much about it at this time. This is an example of the wide range of the carbon to nitrogen ratio that, that you mentioned, and um, w what we have is diversity there, going from wood chips, well, I don't know whether that's practical or newspaper, but anyway, from 82 to 11 to 1, which is a soil equilibrium value, we have to learn how to combine those to give us the right option uh, for the CN ratio to release the most nutrients for us or to give us the best structure or enhance the growth of fungi or whatever the specific objective is. And so this is one of the things that I've learned after about 50 years of this is the word diversity means looking at the big picture and trying to put together pieces of the puddle to accomplish a more specific objective. Uh, some of it's got to be with trial and error and there are probably some risks and problems to make out of that. So uh, the carbon to nitrogen ratio, we already talked about that, but conservation starts with a C and ends with an N. So conservation is important in terms of some of these nutrient cycling uh, strategies that we're trying to develop. Uh, this is a basically a repeat of what I did in one of the previous slides. We go from 46% carbon to 58% carbon, in this case 12% difference. That difference is in those natural nutrients that you're recycling for the next generation of plants. Uh, those are some of the critical elements that are important for us, the macro and the micronutrients, and you probably know that, that better than I do. But one of the things that organic matter and managing the carbon does is help with the availability of those micronutrients. Uh, you know, we don't put those on in large amounts, but the fact that when the system is working and the, and the carbon is cycling, we have more opportunities for some of these micronutrients that we still not have good answers on what the limit is in terms of what's required for optimum production. Mentioned biodiversity. Uh, someone else had a similar slide yesterday. Uh, I'm, I'm amazed at what that's doing, and this is just illustrates what can be in terms of seed size and uh, function of those. One of the things with cover crops is the diversity within the system, and this is uh, some data from Adamir Caligari, who's on for this afternoon. And for the protein content for these, I think, 17 or 18 cover crops, you can see that it would go from a maximum of 23.9 to a minimum, what, 4.8. There's a five-fold variation depending on which cover crop you want and what, what type of protein content you're interested in at the end. So we got this diversity in the cover crop species with respect to protein generation. If you look at the carbon, it's pretty stable, and I'm not sure about the 15... 59 over there, but it's there from what, 37 to 40 some percent with that one outlier at, at 59. And I haven't got Adamir to, to explain that to me. But if you take a look at the nitrogen, and you all know the difference between nitrogen and legumes and nitrogen and straw, wheat straw, we have a variation from 3.82 to what, 0.77 or a five fold variation in nitrogen. So if you want to put a lot of nitrogen in the system, what do you want? Do you want some of these that's got the higher amounts? If you're not too concerned about the nitrogen, you can choose one of the other uh, combinations for that. Similarly for phosphorus, maximum 0.3 in terms of percent co uh, content to 0.05, a six-fold variation. We have to understand what that means and then utilize whatever skills we have to put the combination of these diverse components together to accomplish the specific goal that you want. Zinc is another example from 66 to 8 for the one that we have, an eight-fold variation in zinc. And if you have deficiencies in your system with zinc, um, you would want to put one in that would 
be able to extract more from the soil and end up with a higher content in that plant material. Brag about this a little bit. <laughs> Climate change conundrum. Um, we, we have some uh, challenges ahead of us, but we need to harness the power of nature to help stabilize some of these climate extremes. So uh, from my perspective, we've got to maximize the carbon capture. We've got to have a continuous living cover on the soil, delivering root exudates to the soil biology. We need continuous living cover to protect our soil aggregates. Deep-rooted crops for maximum water storage, and on and on with all the benefits that we understand with the cover crops. And so we have this soil plant atmosphere system, and we must learn to manage the carbon from all aspects of that. And ultimate goal, from my perspective, is food, feed, fiber, and fuel for the global population. And with that, if we do it with a conservation agriculture system, then we end up with uh, all these other benefits for us. Uh, I've already talked a little bit about the increase in water use efficiency, and your homework assignment will be to go over that. Um, and I discussed this a little bit earlier in the, in, the, in the presentation the other day. One thing I would like to emphasize is the synergistic relationship between the plant roots and the earthworms. And the picture on the right is a friend, uh, uh, Frederick Thomas, shows that that taproot of the sugar beet is going down to two meters. And we've also looked at other crops where the earthworm will follow down the tunnel of that root and it becomes a food tunnel for the earthworm. So he goes down and cleans out that, gets good energy, smears the wall with microbial goo for the bacteria in that. And then the next year, that pore, if there's no tillage, remains there and the roots will just shoot right down to that depth again, exert some energy to expand and go deeper, and you end up with doubling the root system to double the nutrient volume to extract from, and the water that's available. And so just by going um, 90 centimeters deep, uh, you can accumulate uh, or make available about another 76 millimeters of water stored in that system. And so we're using full, the full profile rather than just the top one that we end up with when we do uh, major tillage. Some examples of some data on the water served. Uh, the mulch effect been measured, and, and I have literature citations for these, saves about 76 millimeters, and these are in a six month growing season. Uh, they can uh, increase the infiltration by 76 millimeters. The soil organic matter with a 1% carbon increase can give you a 51 millimeters accumulation. And with the cover crops access, can give you another 76 millimeters. Well, each one of those amounts is no big deal by themselves, but when you add the total up, it's 279 millimeters of water. And that can come in handy sometime when you have a drought. So we have to look at the little things that are happening and start accumulating so we can get major effects. There's a nice term, eco-hydrology. Um, and so I think if any were here to talk the other day, I used this one, so I'll skip that. Um, I've already talked about carbon cycling and carbon management. I put it in there twice so I'd have an opportunity to talk about that. And uh, uh, it, it's often a confusing and controversial debate, partly because of the inconsistent use and the improper use of the word sequestration. Um, that's some of my personal biases. We need to understand the carbon dynamics, uh, a quote from a colleague again, the 4% per uh, 1,000 initiative, you guys know more about that than I do, and I support it 120%. So, uh, this are some of the, some of the things that uh, are um, accomplished through that initiative, and I think it's important that uh, we continue to promote that and sell the benefits. Some of these things are not very big impacts. But when you start adding 10 little small benefits, it becomes a major impact. And we in agriculture have to start learning to use these small incremental benefits and put them together in a total system so that we can make these major changes in the, uh, 
in our production and Okay, conservation agriculture systems, oh my. I have to show you this slide. Conservation agriculture is based on three principles. Continuous residue cover, diverse rotation, cover crops, and continuous minimum soil disturbance. These three principles operate and wrap around carbon cycling, my biases. But we also allow for local complementary agricultural practices because there's no two farmers that are same. There's no two farms that are same. And so the, we, we, we allow for cattle to graze and other options in it so that there's site-specific things that can be fine-tuned, but the three principles are still an important part in the conservation agriculture system. Um, the specific practices that are chosen to implement the principles, uh, it must be adapted in each production system and soil climate, and ecosystem, and geographic location, and on and on. So it, it, the principles work anywhere globally, but the direct application and the benefits got to come from matching the, the specific needs for the site. The synchronization is important to get the, the benefits from that. The uh, integration of those three principles and the carbon cycling around it develops in these synergistic benefits, but we need both to synchronize these three principles and the synergistic benefits to get something that's going to be true conservation agriculture and be the base of our food security. I talked about this the other day. I'm sorry that we're running out of time, but um, I talked about that before. And so I uh, think I'm getting close to the end. Our soils are, uh, contain a lot of living biological partners and uh, are enabling carbon and nutrient cycling synergies that we haven't thought about before. And so from my perspective, soil degradation is caused by one word, tillage. Soil recovery is accomplished by one word, carbon. And the soil health maintenance is accomplished by one word, carbon. And I end up with my cartoon carbon, carby carbon. The text doesn't show out on the Apple machine, but carby carbon says keep your carbon footprint small and manage for ecosystem services and be a mega voice for carbon management.